Take your seats. We're going to get ready. Please rise for the national anthem. Thank you, Mrs. Howard. <clears throat> if precincts 8 through 14 did not organize prior to the meeting, if 8 and, well, 8 we organized, I don't know if 9 organized upstairs by the clerk's office, 10 and 11 over by the, well, let's do 10 and 11 out front because the boys lacrosse team is selling us goodies tonight. And then 12, 13, and 14 will be over in this corridor. Please meet during the first few minutes of the break and organize. Um, otherwise, do we have any town meeting members who have not yet been sworn in? Looks like everybody's been sworn in. Okay. Mr. Dunn. Two thousand thirteen at eight PM. All in favor, please say yes. yes. Opposed? No opposition. It is affirmative vote. Um, any announcements or resolutions? Mr. Dunn first. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Uh, I would like to welcome some very special guests that we have with us tonight. It is uh, our sister city from Nagaoka Co. Co. Excuse me and who are joining us. It is the 29th year of this relationship between the two cities. And up in the gallery, you can see a group of students who have been joined with us for three weeks. So if we could give them... So they have been staying here in town and going to classes for the last three weeks. They have been staying with host families here in town. Um, town meeting member Carl Wagner is one of the hosts who has been hosting. And <laughs> so if you want to learn about what it's like to be a host family because you're interested in doing it in the future, please talk to Carl. They even they got to go to a Red Sox game, so I, uh, and that's been part of their activity. I would invite, like to invite everyone to the Cherry Blossom Festival, which will be at Audison School on Friday from 6 p.m. to 8 p.m., which is kind of the culmination of the trip and a big celebration. And so I would like to invite uh, from our sister city, Mr. Koji, who has a few words to, uh, to speak to us. Welcome. Thanks. Good evening. Good evening. First, we are surprised at the terrorism that broke out in Boston. We pray uh, for quick recovery um, of those who are injured. On behalf of Nagaoka Kyo City, thank you for your warm welcome. Um, we are very happy to be here. Uh, thank you again for hosting our students. We really appreciate it. Thank you so much.
Thank you. Do you have any something else? We received notice, uh, the town clerk received notice today that in record time, the attorney general has approved the actions of the special town meeting article two, which is to say that the attorney general has already approved the new leaf blower regulations, which means that those will take effect after they've been printed twice in the advocate, which I understand is scheduled to be on the second and the ninth. So believe it or not, uh, it's gonna happen before May 15th. Mr. Jameson, who I was supposed to call before the recycling article two on the pet bottles, yeah. but here he is. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. I have a couple quick things. Um, first, I want to thank uh, Mr. Lobel again for printing our badges. It's a really nice uh, service he provides. Uh, you may be aware I was the proponent for uh, one of the proponents for Article 11. I posted a, a, some background on that to the uh, listserv so that people can see why we're looking at that. Um, it's a firearms issue. Uh, Mr. Moderator, I, uh, I rose when someone else was speaking during the special uh, meeting, Article 2, last week, um, seeking clarification for a point of law. And I, I fumbled that process uh, rather badly, I felt, so I want to apologize to the body but I seek clarification on how does one appropriately seek clarification for a point of law um, during discussion when you are not up next or not on the list. And I ask this in particular because this is the second time in 10 years that this has happened to me. That would actually be a proper point of information. If you get up and just- So I just have to be, be more, more uh, persistent. Yeah, it's a pro point of information. I'm confused as to a um, point of law, point of law okay. on this particular article, then we'll get the able-bodied Miss Rice up to tell us what she knows. And she told me that she knew of no regulation that was, never mind. Um, <laughs> in the special town meeting, uh, Article 4, um, the Recycling Committee uh, met on that and had an opinion, a positive, favorable opinion. Um, we thought that over five years, uh, listening to Mr. Tosti and Mr. Dunn, we might save as much as forty to $60,000 in incineration costs not only of the plastic, but the residual water that's often in the plastic if they are not recycled. And to warm the cuckles of the moderator's heart, um, I am the proponent for the bus shelter uh, that was put forth, a uh, committee that was put forth before town meeting before the moderator was uh, in service. And I believe mm -hmm. also the Liberty Ride Committee. Oh, I forget that one, but I remember the bus shelter committee. Okay, well, um, perhaps we should separate the vote. It doesn't matter if we disband something that doesn't exist, right? That can't hurt. Okay, so I, <laughs> um, I've talked to the ATED people, and I think that they would be best suited to uh, carry on this uh, charge that I hope to, that no one ever really took, whatever. Um, and I'm giving them materials and happy to meet with them in a future date. So I move uh, dissolution of the bus shelter and liberty ride committees. All in favor of dissolving the bus shelter and livery ride committee, please say yes. Yes. Opposed? Thank, you. Thank no. you, Mr. Moderator. Thank you, sir. Mr. Rowe? Clarissa Rowe, uh, Prink Scene 4. I'm up tonight um, with John Cole, who will be here at the break. You'll see on your seats um, a fundraising letter that we are um, endeavoring to do. There are a number of Books for Bill members here tonight, um, Sherry Barron, The Diced, Jeff Thielman, people that can't be mentioned because they're not supposed to be doing fundraising, but have been very helpful on the committee. Um, Bill Shea was a wonderful man, and many of you have already given money for his, um, the library at the new um, Thompson School is gonna be named after him. But for those of you that have managed to miss our many entreaties, we'll be um, at the back of the hall in the front hall near the bench during um, the break. If you have any questions and you wanna ask us more about what, what's going on with the books, we have raised um, about three quarters of our um, goal and we're very happy about it and we can't wait to have the children of the Thompson School benefit. So we do hope you'll, you'll consider donating to Books for Bill 
He was a um, man who served our town very well and was one of us. So thank you. Um, Mr. Chappett. Uh, Mr. Moderator, are, are announcements in order now? Yep, that's what oh, we're doing, you. announcements and resolutions. Uh, Roland Chappett, Precinct 12, very quickly, before you, um, your leaf rakes wear out, we have a cleanup day scheduled this coming Saturday from 9 to 1. There'll be refreshments, bring the kids. They're gonna have a chance to fly some kites if the wind is good. And we want to get it all done so that we're ready for July 4th, our big show. Thank you. Robin's Farm, of course. <laughs> 9 a.m. Road? Yes, something. 9 a.m. Road at Robin's Farm. Any other announcements or resolutions? Ms. Mahan? Um, just two. Uh, the first one is uh, there was a cleanup at McLennan Park this past weekend, and Jeannie Leary and some other members of the Summer Street um, Neighborhood Association want to let you all know that this Saturday, May 4th, at 10 a.m., there will be a cleanup at Hills Hill, which is adjacent to the uh, Ed Burns Skating Arena, uh, the rink, whatever you want to call it. And the, uh, oh, I shouldn't say whatever you want to call it, but that's the area. It's on Summer Street. So they would love to see you all there. And the other thing is, um, I was proud to be here last night at the Arlington High School Boys Basketball Banquet, where they honored the cheerleaders and some other members, as well as, I just wanted to announce that um, Margaret Potter's son, Alex, along with being named to the Mass. Uh, all academic basketball team, which um, recognizes the top athletes in the state. Um, Alex was also named the Paul Leone Memorial Sportsmanship Award, um, which has been given out for the past six or seven years. And I just wanted to let you all know that. And that certainly is, um, if you were here last night, you could feel the emotion in the room in terms of the honor and the award that was bestowed upon this player. Um, and I just want to let you all know of that. Thank you. That he's out playing ball every night. I hear him when I walk the dog. <laughs> Any other announcements or resolutions? Mr. Harrington. Sean Harrington, Precinct 15. I'd like to uh, let uh, town meeting know that the Arlington Republican Town Committee will be having its monthly meeting at the Arlington Senior Center this Thursday at 7.15 p.m. Thank you. Any further announcements or resolutions? Seeing none, um, reports or committees. Any committee have a report? Mr. Gilligan. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Stephen Gilligan, Town Treasurer. I move that the report of the Treasurer to the 2013 Annual Town Meeting be received. A second. Okay. All in favor? Aye. Opposed? That report is before the before Thank the body. You. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Mr. Moderator, if I may, I have no intention of reading the report. Uh, you can all read that on your own and get a good night's sleep. Uh, but I just would like to point out a couple of um, um, major points. Uh, we have been fortunate to attain our AAA credit rating from Standard and Poor's for the eighth consecutive borrowing. I would also like to report that our investment income for the trust funds is over 12% for the 2012 calendar year. And further like to say we are in an excellent cash position and all our bank deposits are 100% collateralized. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Thank you, Mr. Gilligan. <laughs> Any other reports to committees? Ms. Mahan. Um, thank you, Mr. Moderator. In keeping with the previous speakers, as well as your remarks the first night, um, what I would like to do is to ask this town meeting to dissolve the 2012 Special Town Meeting Leaf Blower Committee, which included not only myself, but Gary Tibbetts, Jill Schneider, George Adelman, Carol Band, Nancy Butts, Joe Kuski, Bill Downing, Charles Grandin, Richard Horan, Joe Kerbel, Maria Romano, and Michael Rodeman which uh, of the 13 members, eight were town meeting members. So I respectfully request um, that you dissolve the committee. All in favor of dissolving that committee, please say yes. yes. Opposed? No. And we thank all the members of that committee for their hard work. Thank you. 
Any others? Any other reports of committees? Seeing none, Mr. Tosti? We've all moved that we table Article 3. All in favor of table Article 3, please say yes. Yes. Opposed? Table 3 is articled. That br table, Article 3 is tabled. That brings us to Article 13. Bylaw Amendment Animal Control Regulations. Uh, Mr. Dunn. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Town Council Juliana Rice will give the report on this article. Ms. Rice. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Juliana Rice, Town Council. Um, in, as reported in the Selectman's report, in October of 2012, there were fairly comprehensive changes to the state animal control laws. Um, this legislative package was driven largely by the Animal Rescue League and the MSPCA. The provision that you might have seen that got a fair bit of attention in the press um, was a prohibition on uh, local regulations based on breed, um, which is not something that Arlington had. Um, and another uh, provision that got some attention was that uh, dangerous dogs may no longer be banished from towns. Um, many of these changes were to be implemented by uh, local bylaws or ordinances. Um, some others uh, were not necessarily um, required to be in local bylaws or ordinances, but I thought as long as we were going through the whole thing, it made sense to kind of collect all of the um, relevant uh, state law requirements in one place to make it easy to access and um, implement. Um, I want to be clear at the outset that there is no change at all being proposed uh, to the Town of Arlington's leash law, its off-leash dog park hours, or um, the pooper scooper requirement. Um, the new requirements from the state law are in some places exceedingly specific and that's why the proposed bylaw in front of you is so long and detailed. Um, and I know it is a lot to go through, but um, I think in the end it's going to be more um, clear and easier for people to uh, access all the relevant requirements in one place. There are four main areas that are addressed in this proposed bylaw from the state law. The first is how um, uh, the Board of Selectmen is to treat complaints about dangerous and nuisance dogs, and there are actually very detailed um, definitions now of what is a dangerous or a nuisance dog. The law heretofore had uh, much more vague standards in place. Um, there are requirements for how and when um, and under what conditions dogs can be chained or tethered outside. I don't think this is something that comes up so often in this part of the state, but in other parts of the state. Uh, licensing provisions are changed in some ways that we already had in place, for example. Uh, lower license fees for dogs that are spayed or neutered. Now that's required by state law. We already had that in place. And then um, another uh, fairly significant change is in uh, kennels. And um, there are five different types of kennels in the state law. And uh, one of those types encompasses uh, what's known as a doggy daycare. And we have in Arlington two of those uh, businesses. Under these new requirements, they will need to be licensed. Um, I have um, been in touch with one of those businesses and with the lawyer for another one, so they are familiar with this. Um, and you'll see in the um, proposed bylaw that there are five different types of kennels. Uh, for, um, for ease of use, I proposed giving them uh, kennel A1, A2. That's something that I just made up, uh, but I thought it would be a little bit easier. Not all of those types of kennels would necessarily be allowed under zoning but the two that we already have um, obviously are already allowed under zoning. Um, but the licensing requirements you know, would be in place to the extent any other types of kennels would be allowed under zoning. Um, so I had a couple of um, minor corrections that I've discussed with the moderator I just wanted to run through, and then I'd be available for any questions anybody had. Um, it has been pointed out to me correctly and I'm looking at the draft bylaw on page, starting on page five of the um, Board of Selectmen's report. Um, it's been pointed out to me correctly that in the first sentence I have section two, that should be article two. On page six, under 
C3D, um, the paragraph that starts at the time of attack or threat, there should be a comma after the word public. On page 11, yep, page six, in the middle of the page, paragraph D, it's under section C that starts on page five, Roman numeral three, and then D, there's a paragraph that starts at the time of attack or threat. The person or animal attacked or threatened had breached an enclosure or structure. This is in the definition of a dangerous dog, comma, including but not limited to a gated and fenced in area, comma, in which the dog was kept apart from the public. There should be a comma after public without being authorized to do so by the owner of the premises. And then there are two on page 11. First in the inset paragraph, lower Roman five, V, that starts the length of the tether. Six lines down, guardians or keepers property, there should be an apostrophe before the S in keepers. And then in numbered paragraph six at the bottom of the page, no person owning or keeping a dog shall subject the dog to cruel conditions or inhumane chaining or the tethering, that the should be deleted. And if uh, the town meeting sees fit to make those changes administratively, I will provide the clerk with a corrected copy. Uh, can make those changes administratively. Please coordinate with uh, Ms. Lucarelli tomorrow. Thank you, Mr. Mr. Moderator. Um, so I stand ready to ask any questions that anyone, uh, to answer any questions anyone may have. Okay. Correct. Thank you very much. Yes, page eight. Under impoundment pending appeal, A, order of impoundment. Pending an appeal, the hearing authority may, there's a, the word A, may A petition, that A should come out, and I will make that change. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, Ms. Mamone. Hi, Serena Memon, Precinct 21. I am up here because, first of all, this is really lengthy, and I think it's good for us to review this since it took a long time to get the uh, off-leash hours, which I think is great that we have them for the morning. I just don't think we need something for the evening. Um, I'm just going to go over some things that were annoying to me or I need more clarification. Barking, um, is this for, peop uh, for the house barking or in and out of the yard barking? Is there, like, specifics that... Um, you got from the Animal Rescue League or MSPCA? Ms. Rice? Uh, thank you. If you could point me to where you're looking at. Oh, the um, one under nuisance on, on page five. Mm -hmm. uh, under uh, I, 1A, I. Yep. Excessive barking. We're wondering, I'm wondering what that, is this for in the house, out of the house, in the yard? Is there any clarification how long? Um, I know it says uh, in the next paragraph, reasonable, and I guess that's, it must be a law term or something because I'm not so sure what that's, that's vague to me. Right. I mean, it could be either outside or inside, anything that, were, or that um, presented a problem to neighbors or somebody else. They can bring a complaint to the Board of Selectmen, and so it's a, the basis of the complaint could be barking that you find annoying. Okay, so it's a 24-hour thing. There's no, like hours or anything that you have Correct. To, okay. Uh, let's see. Um, I had also a question about this uh, child on, on page six. I had a, a question about the child in another a person's yard. It's not considered trespassing. I understand that's un understandable, but I just want to make sure this doesn't lead to like um, 
putting up gates later on or something that we're, as dog owners, have to, in the future, consider? Because <laughs> I can just see this as a gateway to something else. Mm -hmm. um, well, how, this is part of the sort of brand new and very detailed definitions of what a dangerous or nuisance dog would be. But essentially, the way this is written is it states that if uh, someone trespasses into the property of a dog, um, you know, onto private property, and a dog is restrained or, or secluded there, and the dog um, attacks a person, that the fact that the person was trespassing will be taken into account when the Board of Selectmen considers whether but that dog is dangerous. But I understand, but then you have a child is not right. considered. But, so. but that the fact that a child is trespassing would right. not, the fact that it was a child, they would not right. be considered to have trespassed. But I just don't want to have this, like, uh, you know, people that have um, swimming pools, they have to put up a, a, a fence or something. So I'm just curious if you had heard anything. Another thing I, I want a clarification is um, hearing authority. Uh, do we know how big the hearing authority is going to be? Who, how many people or uh, how long? Um, the hearing authority would be the Board of Selectmen. Okay. All right. And then I have uh, asked two veterinarians about this tethering thing uh, on page 10. You have a uh, dog under six months old should not be tethered. Um, they had not heard anything like that. When I got my dog, she was eight weeks old, and we pretty much started her a week or so after she came into our house, um, wanting to be outside, and she's a snow dog, so she loved being out there for almost 12 hours in a day. And, I, I just feel like are we putting more problems out there um, as a result? Um, it's, it's not a, something I considered the policy of because it comes directly from the state law. It may not be wise, but that is oh. what was adopted. Okay, and last one that I have is a cable mounted, page 11. You have a greater, the cable has to be greater than four feet in height and less than seven feet. Do you know why they said that? Because I, I just think this sounds unreasonable too. But I don't know why, I'm sorry. Okay. Okay. Well, I'm not voting for it, but this is what I just wanted some clarification. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Bayer. <coughs> Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Paul Bayer, Precinct 13. Uh, I think there's one other little typo that should be corrected on page 9, section 7A. It starts, if an owner of a keeper of a dog, and I believe it should be, if an owner or a keeper of a dog. Oh yeah, I thought that was one Ms. Rice had picked up, but thank All you right. very much. Thank you. Shame on you. Thank you, Mr. Bayer. Anything and, else? And I have um, one question. As I recall from dog debates a few years ago, I thought I was told there was a limit uh, that you could have no more than three dogs in a household in Arlington. Was that true, and does this change that? Ms. Rice. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Um, that was true. That is being changed under this proposed bylaw, and the reason it is is because um, under that proposed bylaw, three dogs was termed a kennel and a kennel was not allowed. Under the new state law definition of kennel, if we kept that in place, the two existing businesses would not be allowed to operate. Okay, thank you. Uh, Mr. Harrington, Sean. Um, General, did you have your third? I can't see who, yeah, did you have your hand up? Yeah, I couldn't see who you were, sorry, yeah. It's Mr. Kaplan. Uh, Bill Kaplan, Precinct 6. Um, just more grammar stuff. Uh, page 5, uh, Section A, Article 3. Uh, I think we have a double negative here that has threatened or attacked livestock, a domestic animal, or a person in a manner not grossly disproportionate under all the circumstances, which I, I think means they've threatened someone in a proportionate manner, which is probably not the intention. Uh, like you kick a dog and he threatens you, that's proportionate. Disproportionate would be the dog looks at you funny, or you look at him funny and he bites you, that's disproportionate. So uh, I think uh, unless there's something going on here that I'm not aware of, I, I think you've got that mixed up. Ms. Rice. Sorry to say that one's actually intentional. Um, the uh, nuisance dog provisions talk about you can have a threat or an attack 
but if it was um, provoked in some way, then the dog would be a nuisance dog. If without justification there was a threat or an attack, then the dog would be a dangerous dog. So when you say not grossly disproportionate, you, you mean that they're responding in a, a reasonable manner? Well, to me as a lawyer, that means something a little bit different. Um, and so what I did is I really took the language directly out of the state law and I realized mm. it's clunky. Mm. But to me, it would be a different meaning if I said the dog was behaving reasonably as well, opposed to the dog was not behaving unreasonably. Well, uh, I guess I'm, I'm still not quite clear on how to interpret not grossly disproportionate under the circumstances, because that essentially means proportionate under the circumstances. What, um, how I would advise the Board of Selectmen if it were considering um, a, a complaint under this section would be that there had been a threat or an attack, but given all the circumstances, so that's a cause for concern, but mm -hmm. given all the circumstances, it was not unreasonable, grossly disproportionate. It could be a little disproportionate, and you're still not talking about a nuisance, a dangerous dog, but it's not grossly disproportionate. If it's grossly disproportionate, that's a dangerous dog. So you can't go get your neighbor's dog all whipped up and then complain about it? Well, that, that's kind of what it says here, is that the dog is, you know, they're behaving in a manner not grossly disproportionate under the circumstances. So again, if you kick the dog and he bites you, that would be uh, behaving in a manner not grossly disproportionate. Uh, if you, you know, say stop and he bites you, that's, that's grossly disproportionate. So well, I can't say what particular um, events would give rise to the application of this section, but I think I agree with your statement. So, okay, I, like I said, I'm just, I think that the language is wrong here. I think you've got a double negative that you're not quite aware of, and you're sort of saying the opposite of what you're trying to say. Um, no, that'll, be, that'll mean the opposite. I mean, I, certainly if someone wants to offer an amendment, that's fine. To me, it, it makes sense. So, okay. Mr. McCabe, Mark. I'm Mark McCabe, Precinct 2. I move to terminate debate on Article 13. 13 and all matters before it. Okay, we have a motion to terminate debate on Article 13, all matters before it. All in favor, please say yes. Yes. Opposed? No. In my opinion, debate is terminated. We have before us a recommended bylaw amendment of the Board of Selectmen on Article 13. All in favor, please say yes. Yes. Opposed? In my opinion, it is affirmative vote, and I so declare it. That closes Article 13 and brings us to Article 14. Thank you, Mr. Single Moderator. Single-serve gasoline stations. Mr. Dunn. I apologize for jumping in there, Mr. Moderator. You don't apologize. It's your job. Uh, town meeting, you have before you the vote of the, of the Board of Selectmen and our comment. This was a 10-voter article, and when it, the uh, proponents came before the board, we considered several issues, including whether or not there was adequate safety. We considered uh, th whether or not uh, we looked at the ADA requirements, which are that there has to be um, uh, available for someone who is disabled. There does have to be pumping available for them. Uh, we looked at what some of the neighboring towns did, and we considered whether or not there was any really compelling reason to keep, like, legal safety or otherwise reason to keep it around. And so at that, for that reason, the majority voted to change the rule. We understand, or I understand personally since then, that the proponent has changed his mind. Um, and I, but I look forward to the town meeting debate and seeing what you all think we should do. Uh, Mr. Wagner. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Point of order, uh, may I change the proposed motion from a yes-no vote to a vote of no action? No, it's not. Your, you lost control of it when the selectmen put okay. it in the warrant. You can uh, say that you don't want it to happen, though. Thank you. Um, I'm the principal yeah. proponent of something that I'm about to uh, ask you to vote no on. I hope we'll do this quickly so that we can get on to other meeting business. Um, very briefly, uh, I thought a few months ago it would be nice if I could pump my own gas. And the question is, of course, a very colorful and a very deep one. Um, 
I proposed what I thought was a simple removal of regulations in Arlington, and whether you like it or don't like it, that's what I proposed. Um, unfortunately, after talking to a lot of yes and no people on this, I now think that my simple proposal was like Jonathan Swift's uh, basic proposal. It needs it needs more work. Um, particularly, I was pleased to hear that the um, the ARB and the zoning bylaws are set to be um, significantly looked over in the next year. And uh, my action would not, in my opinion, safeguard the people of Arlington if we did what I was intending to simply do. Um, basically, I don't think it would safeguard having full serve at gas stations, and I don't think it would safeguard us from sort of Winchester, Hess, mega type stations. Um, I ask you, rather than debating this, to uh, vote my motion soundly down, and also potentially to vote soundly down the amendment to 14, which is also, I think, very good and, and well thought out, but doesn't get to these points of protecting people who do like full serve or protecting us from mega stations. So I'm sorry for bringing this to you um, in this way. I also wanted to briefly say that I think the selectmen voted correctly on the general idea that Arlington by now can move from 1950s style laws to having self-serve. But um, since getting their approval, I had the additional information from the uh, inspectional services people that said if you voted yes on this, they would have to allow stations um, that would have no full serve and currently there would be no limit on the size of stations. And although some of you might think I'm a crazy person for wanting to have self-serve, I think everybody probably would like to have uh, full serve, self serve, and not have a change in the feel of our gas stations. So I ask you to resoundingly vote no, and maybe someone will terminate debate after me. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Mr. Warden. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. John Warden, Precinct 8. And, uh, uh, not surprisingly, because I never do it, I'm not moving to terminate debate. Uh, Mr. Moderator, for the record, I'll formally hand you the sign original signed copy of my subsequent motion. Thank you. Uh, <coughs> um, this was uh, made available uh, on the... Um, first night of town meeting and also I think the second night and there's I think a few more copies still on the back table but I I will read it it's very brief um, in, in, instead of um, uh, my, my substitute motion is that uh, article 5 uh, self-service gas dispensing of title 5 of the town bylaws be amended by striking out the present language and inserting in place the following a gasoline station may permit, <coughs> at its discretion, customers to pump their own gasoline, provided that without additional charge or on reasonable delay, the station provides an employee to pump gasoline for any customer who so requests. And I did this because um, uh, it seems to me, as, as the uh, original proponent of this ill-conceived idea now admits, uh, um, there are a number of circumstances in which uh, people are not well equipped or well disposed uh, to pump their own gasoline. Uh, the, the primary one, of course, is a disabled person, and although the selectmen uh, blithely say ADA uh, requires the station to deal with the needs of that disabled person, uh, I think uh, in accordance with that ultimate authority on all things, the Arlington List. Uh, someone has uh, looked it up and determined that if the station is, has but a single employee, the uh, sort of girl in a booth who takes your credit card, which I have encountered in other jurisdictions, uh, they don't have to do that. And what's that person in the wheelchair do? I don't know. They don't get any gas, I guess. Hopefully they're not totally out. There are, there are other people in that circumstance, too. Um, uh, you know, the, the, the parent with a couple little kids strapped in their, their uh, 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 baby seats in the back. Um, you're supposed to leave the car, go into the station, give your card, so and leave those kids. That's a criminal offense to leave those kids sitting in the car. You're supposed to unbuckle them, take them out, uh, walk them across three lanes of other cars coming in to pump gas. I don't, I don't think you should do that either. Uh, there, are all, there are elderly people uh, who don't want to pump their own gas. Um, 
There are, your teenage daughter maybe is coming home at 11 o'clock at night. Maybe she shouldn't be out that late, but she is. She's almost out of gas. Do you want her to get out on some dark night uh, with all kinds of creepy characters around and pump her own gas? Or your grandmother. I mean, it's the same thing. There are all, all kinds of people who should not have to do this, and, um, and therefore we, we propose this amendment. Now, it's very well to have the amendment, as the gentleman said, but uh, what if... Uh, uh, what if it doesn't work? And, and, and you know, I can come along and, and say to the uh, gas station, hey, I'm, I'm, I'm elderly or, or I'm, well, I am, but, um, uh, <laughs> but um, you know, I, I want you to pump my gas. And he says, no, we, don't, we, we got self-service. Do it yourself. And I say, but we passed a law. He'll say, no, speak English. <laughs> um, <clears throat> so... Um, I think while, while my amendment is a vast improvement over what the selectmen would ask you to do, uh, the, the real improvement is to, as uh, Mr. Wagner suggested, vote the whole thing down. Thank you. Sir. Mr. Schlickman. Oh, wait, we need a second on Mr. Warden's motion. Thank you. I hear a second. Okay. Thank you very much. Paul Schlickman, Precinct 9, motion to terminate debate under this article. All right, we have a motion to terminate debate under this article. All in favor, please say yes. yes. Opposed? No. My opinion it is terminated. <clears throat> First, we have Mr. Warden's substitute motion, which, as he ably described to us, will provide an attendant, even if you want to pump your own. All in favor of Mr. Warden's substitute motion, please say yes. Yes. Opposed? No. My opinion, that's a negative vote. We now have before us a recommended vote of the Board of Selectmen, as printed in their report. All in favor, please say yes. yes. Opposed, say no. No. In my opinion, that is a negative vote, and I so declare it. And that closes Article 14 and brings us to Article 15. Uh, regulation of utility poles. Um, Recommend a vote of the Board of Selectmen, no action. Mr. Um, John Leonard, please, what put purpose to your eyes, sir? I know. Yep. It's got a tie on, it must be important. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. John Leonard, Precinct 17. With a substitute motion on Article Number 15. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, good evening. Last Monday night, on your chairs, was left the substitute motion pertaining to utility poles. If you would turn, please, to page number two, you would notice it is the Article 15 was first presented back in 1999 to the Board of Selectmen. The Board of Selectmen at that particular time voted no action because it was under their opinion at that particular time that they were placing their trust in the utilities to come across with a plan to maintain the polls in the town of Arlington. As you notice at the bottom of the page, three of those utilities are not in existence anymore. When Mr. Rowley Chapit, former head of the Telecommunications Committee and myself, approached the Board of Selectmen on February 25th this year, they expressed interest in the idea, but they were concerned that they thought that they didn't have the authority to do anything in regards to governing the polls in the town of Arlington. At that particular time, some of the selectmen mentioned the possibility of a committee I expressly asked at that particular time, please, this town does not want any more committees. This town does not need any more committees. You are the committee. You should take the lead. They mentioned at that particular time that maybe they should have a discussion with the moderator. They also mentioned at that particular time that maybe I should go out and take pictures of 10 of the worst polls that I know of in the town of Arlington. Another member of the Board of Selectmen at that particular time mentioned, does anybody know how many reports 
since 1999 the town has received from the utilities? The answer at that particular time was one. 14 years, ladies and gentlemen, in one report. They discussed having another meeting. They contacted me for another meeting on March 6th. At that particular time, Mr. Chapin and myself, along with two members of the Board of Selectmen, discussed other things. They again expressed their interest that they were interested in the idea, but they felt that they lacked authority. Again, they mentioned a possible committee. Again, I mentioned to them that the committee is not the way to go, that they are the committee and they should take the lead. I asked that their upcoming meeting on March 11th was it necessary for me to attend. They said not necessary unless I had something new to add. Needless to say, on March 14th, I was greatly disappointed when I read in the local newspaper that not only had they decided to take a vote of no action, but they decided to form a group, AKA committee. It was then that I had to return back to the town library to do more research, which again, at this particular time, I would like to thank the personnel of the Robbins Library for showing me how to turn a computer on and off, <laughs> how to work a printer, and basically to put up with an old guy like myself learning new things. At that particular time, I discovered what is called the Massachusetts General Laws and proceeded to do research on them. What you have in your handout in pages three, four, five, and six are just some of the sections in chapter 166 detailing as far as I'm concerned that the power that the selectmen do have in governing the polls in the town of Arlington. I express to you that we've lost 14 years. In 14 years, there's been growth by the utilities in the town of Arlington, but in 14 years, there's been no maintenance of the utility poles in the town of Arlington. I stress to you again, one report in 14 years. I proceeded to do more research by going to the Middlesex Law Library up in Woburn. And from what I can obtain, ladies and gentlemen, these laws are on the books right now. After serving something like 40, 41 years in the telephone industry, one expression or saying comes to mind. Often I have heard in all the departments that I worked in, the expression, we don't make any money on taking the stuff out. We only make money on putting the stuff in. I submit to you, ladies and gentlemen, it is time to ask the Board of Selectmen to take charge of this with, this, with the knowledge that is obtained in the Massachusetts general laws, and that we should meet this problem head on and take care of business. Again, I thank the aforementioned people that I mentioned, and I stand ready to answer any questions you might possibly have. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mo um, Leonard. We have a second on Mr. Leonard's resolution. Second. Mr. Dunn, you're next. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. I'd like to say, so the Board of Selectmen, obviously, um, we, we heard what Mr. Leonard and the other uh, petitioners brought forward. We want to do what they want to do. There are a lot of polls that are either unsafe or unsightly in town, and they need to, uh, we, we need to encourage the utilities to remove them. However, unfortunately, I do not believe that the statute that Mr. Leonard cites gives us the power to do what it is that he wants us, what, what we all want to do. I be, until what we, so there's a, there's a particularly ugly double, double poll uh, that Mr. Leonard has pointed out to us on the corner of Marathon Street. In a perfect world, what we would do is we'd say, Verizon, you have 14 days or you have 90 days to remove this. And every time that you don't remove it, we're going to fine you $10 a day. We're going to fine you $100 a day, whatever it is that we think it takes to get Verizon to do that. However, we can't find them. The state does not, sit, son, fit, excuse me, does not see fit to give us that power. All we can do is kind of bark at them. We can argue with them and we can pressure them and we can print a picture of it in the advocate and we can talk to them about it and we can demand reports about it. 
I believe that this is something that I, I think that Mr. Leonard makes an excellent point that we have not been as persistent on this issue as we need to be. And I believe that th this issue does require persistence in, a t in talking to the utilities. If we don't provide the, the pressure, like he's, if we do not provide the pressure, they aren't going to do it. However, I will also say that one, one option that we do have is that every time Verizon or somebody else comes forward and says, I'm trying to do a poll, we could say, no, we're not going to let you put in that poll. We're not going to let you put in that cable. And we, theoretically, we do have that option. We could do that. In practice, that is not something that we can do. And I hope before you have an example, earlier in town meeting, we looked at Thompson School and the, the polls that we granted Verizon the right to put up in Thompson. I voted no on that one, but the reason that I voted no is because I had the luxury of knowing that those polls were already there. If I had voted no, and I'd carried the day, and we had actually said no on those polls, and Thompson was sitting there in the dark in the, spring, in the fall when it goes to open, can you imagine how unpleasant that would be for all of us? And it's similar, if you, if, and it's, Thompson is something that belongs to the town, but can you imagine being a homeowner and your home is being held hostage between a standoff between Verizon and the town? I don't think that the, so that is a weapon that we would use very judiciously and very carefully. So I encourage you to support what the town and help us bring Verizon and other utilities to take down the unsafe and unsightly polls. But I ask you to not support the resolution just because I don't think that it is reasonable or achievable. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Mr. Um, Chappett. Thank you, Mr. Moderator, Roland Chabot, Precinct 12. A little history here. Mr. Leonard is correct. Way back when I was on the Telecommunications Committee, we discussed this issue. The concern was the double poles just hung out there and stayed. There was no incentive for the utility companies to remove them. Let me give you a little background on how this has to be done. On a typical pole, there were power lines. They're the ones way up on top. There are telephone lines and cable lines. Now those three entities are controlled and maintained by the utilities that provide that service. NSTAR, for example, is responsible for power lines. So what had happened back eight or 10, 10 more than 10 years ago, was we tried to get the utilities to work cooperatively. If they would take an inventory of all the poles that were set up and we still remained as double poles and kept a, the date that they took that information, then we could help them work out the primary issue, and that is first you have to take off the power lines, and then you have to take off the telephone lines from somebody else, and you have to take the cable lines off of somebody else, and so you, know, you really need to work cooperatively to get all this to happen, because it won't happen all at once. So it's very feasible, and it might be three months before the pole goes out, the double pole goes away. They put the new one in and the other one's hanging there. 90 days is reasonable. But there was one in front of my house, it was two and a half years before they finally got wind to do it, and that was only after we started to make some noise about this whole issue. So Mr. Lennon's proposal is correct. Perhaps, perhaps it will be challenged in terms of how do we go about forcing the utilities to work together, create the data file, and then take action and keep that data file up to date. He's right, there was one report that was made, and that was quite a long time ago, when in fact we really expected they would give us a report once every 90 days or every six months. We kind of keep track and see how quickly those polls are coming down. Didn't happen, didn't happen. So what's happening here, I think, is proper here. We need to put their feet to the fire. Now granted, if the utility companies are the ones who are responsible for this, you know, it's like the fox walks in the chicken coop. How much are they really going to do it? Somebody has to put their feet to the fire. And I think that's what he's suggesting here. We need to make them take some action. Otherwise, they just won't do it. There's nothing in it for them to do it. This is an extra cost that they have to bear, and they don't want to do it. So my issue is support his bylaw and change, and let's see if we can make it happen. Again, if we can get the utility companies to begin to, to understand, we're serious here, we want this done, this is an aesthetic and a safety issue, 
Maybe they'll listen well enough and get going and do it the right way. Thank you. Just to clarify, this is a resolution. It's not a bylaw change. Uh, Ms. Mahan? Diane Mahan, town meeting member of Precinct 14. I also want to let town meeting know I am a retired member of IBEW 2222, which is, uh, when I worked for them, it was AT&T, NET&T, and it's now Verizon, which is one of the main utility companies, um, God bless you, that we're speaking to in this motion. First of all, um, I applaud what uh, Mr. Leonard is attempting to do and has attempted to do for 15 plus years um, here in the town of Arlington. Uh, what I will say is I have worked with the Verizon union members who also see this not only as um, an issue that, that is presented before town meeting, but also as a public safety issue. Um, and they have said to me as an individual retired member that this is something that cities and towns through all the Commonwealth really need to get behind. Um, this is not an issue that the Arlington Board of Selectmen can solve. This is an issue that needs to um, go through the statewide effort in terms of um, how Verizon and any other utility company, um, their feet are held to the fire in terms of 90 days, in terms of fines that, that are passed out to them, um, in terms of any uh, remediation, mitigation that we can get from them. Uh, what can the Board of Selectmen do right now? We can say to uh, Verizon and any other utility companies that come before us, no, we can't give you that service. We're not going to let you lay that service on that pole. And that means that in individual residential homeowner who really has no stake or, or game in this um, arena uh, basically gets penalized. Uh, so my issue would be, I agree, Mr. Leonard, with what he's trying to do. Um, I don't see that the Arlington Board of Selectmen is going to be able to solve this because basically all we could do right now is say no to Verizon and if RCN or any other utility came in, but it's mostly Verizon, sometimes NSTAR National Grid, you can't lay any more services in Arlington. Um, I think more what we should do and what you should expect of your Board of Selectmen is that we work with our state delegation in terms of really working with the Department of Utilities in terms of holding the utilities, Verizon, National Grid, et cetera, holding their feet to the fire. That's something that I, I've certainly always wanted to do. I think that's where we should put our best efforts through. I understand this is a resolution. Um, so in terms of how do we get this fixed, I don't see that your Arlington Board of Selectmen is going to be able to do that because we cannot make Verizon go out and say, make your polls be safer. Um, we need to have that through state relief. So um, I, I would leave it to the wisdom of town meeting on how you vote on the resolution, because it is a resolution, and that will certainly deliver a message. But I would ask everybody here in town meeting tonight that whatever action the Board of Selectmen could take on a statewide level with our state delegation, that you join us all on that. Thank you. Thank you, Madam. Uh, Mr. Bahaman. Good evening, uh, Guillermo Bahamo on Precinct 14, 22 Oakland. Um, more than, this is more than a local problem, and I also think that it's more than, than a state problem. If Arlington were a little town in Germany, we wouldn't have this problem because all of their utilities are underground. Uh, if, if there are big, big uh, snowstorms, no problem. No lines are down because all the lines are down. Uh, the uh, everything is underground. Uh, no, uh, uh, and they're they're also waterproof. So that uh, and and I think and and we have to bear the problem if we are willing to pay for a better under structure. Then we cannot continue being very much of an underdeveloped state, city, or country. Is uh, is uh, we are only getting what we are willing to pay. Uh, in a smaller scale, if you are, if you have a certain way, yes, uh, Verizon will do it for you. And 
and we do it all the time because we have the power of very large people uh, standing behind us. We tell them, no, we don't want this, we don't want these lines, we don't want this utility, we want a better design, and they do it because otherwise they'll say, well, you lose 400 accounts. But if you're a single homeowner, the uh, single homeowner is not able to say to Verizon or, or to uh, NSTAR, um, I don't want this uh, pole right in front of my uh, um, entry to my house because uh, that poor person doesn't have the weight that, that a landlord with 400 or 2,000 units has. So it's, uh, I think that the, uh, the matter should be in the hands of the uh, selectmen and they should be the ones to negotiate case by case or maybe group by group how we are willing to pay more for our services because uh, Verizon or RCN is going to pass the cost to us. How much are we willing to pay uh, for, for a safer world so that, so that we are not without electricity for two or three days or even four or seven hours? I think that we should pay more, but, but we, have to bear, we have to bear that in, that in mind. It's, it's not just aesthetics, but it's also safety and cost. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. McQuarrie, you. Uh, Hugh McCrory, Precinct 20. <clears throat> yeah, I, I don't disagree with either the, uh, the proponents of the, uh, of the article or the Board of Selectmen uh, from what they've said. Um, but I, th uh, I think there are two issues here. Uh, there's an issue of unsightliness and an issue of un uh, whether the poles are, are safe or not. So, um, the, board of, uh, the chairman of the Board of Selectmen stated that tonight that he, he mentioned that there are, there are unsafe poles out there. I just want to clarify first of all from him if that's a statement of opinion or is that a statement of fact? And if it's a statement of fact, has it been certified? Do, do we know that there are poles which are unsafe? That's a question to the Board of Selectmen. safe is a matter of degrees. Uh, so a double pole is a permitted to exist, but part of the reason that they aren't permitted to exist in the long run is because they aren't as safe as single poles. I don't, I, I'm told this, I'm not enough of an engineer to answer yeah. what it is. If, so do I, do I fear walking the streets of Arlington? Absolutely not. There are no live wires out there that I know of. There are certainly things, there, but there are wires, for instance, that are looser than they should be. Um, uh, so I think uh, uh, brick sidewalks in some ways are unsafe. Unsafe is a relative thing. Well, uh, maybe I can, uh, can I, uh, I'll pose another question. Aesthetics is one thing, and uh, double poles are one thing. I think the town meeting and the town itself needs to know whether or not we have unsafe poles in Arlington. Um, hopefully we don't, I, and I assume we don't. I mean, if we, if we do have any, any poles which are questionably unsafe, because it sounds like it's a matter of degree, and I think we have a lot of talented employees in our town to, to figure that out and to, and to get a recommendation to the board selectmen of whether or not we do have polls which require immediate attention or not. There's the nothing, point. in my opinion, that meets the level of being an active safety hazard that requires an immediate response. Okay. Yeah, that's, that's pretty clear. Yeah, so I, I think it's, um, it's two, two separate arguments. and, and uh, I would prioritize it in terms of whether poles are unsafe or not. And uh, if anyone knows of any poles which are, that look unsafe, I would please bring it to the attention of the board selectmen. And obviously they'll appoint someone who, or they'll know what to do. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Ms. Knobloch? Nicole, did you have a question or a statement? Nicole Knobloch, Precinct 8. Um, just to the safe, unsafe question, there's a pole around the corner from Jam and Java that my husband and I noticed a few weeks ago that is like this. I mean, you looked up and said, oh my God, how did that happen? Um, so I think there are poles that are visibly scary. But the question I have is, if we pass this amendment, does it hurt the selectmen to have this vote from town meeting saying that the people of Arlington are concerned? So that's my question. 
Clarify again, it's not an amendment, it's a resolution. Sorry, re if we pass the, a resolution, which... The town meeting is basically saying to the selectmen, hey, we want you to do something, but we can't force you to. So it would be sort of like us encouraging them to do it, so it won't yeah, hurt so or help my, them. Yeah, so in my opinion, I think we should vote for it, because I think any time you're trying to have leverage, especially with big companies, and you're trying to have, as selectman Dunn suggested, press coverage or any other sort of hue and cry, it only helps to hear from the town that we are concerned and we would like them to do something. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Swilling? Nathan Swilling, Precinct 4, move to terminate. On, on, on all matters before the article? On all, we have motion to terminate debate on all matters all matters before the article. Second, is it debate? Point of information. What's your point of information, sir? Harry McKay, Precinct 21. Before we vote on this, would you clarify the question of resolution versus substitute motion? The, the paperwork that I have says substitute motion. Yes. I don't know where the idea of a resolution came into the discussion. So could you clarify that for me? Yes, I will. Mr. Leonard has submitted a substitute motion to substitute in lieu of the Board of Selectmen's recommended vote of no action. Therefore, it's a substitute. But if you read it, the town meeting hereby resolves. That makes it a resolution. He's not proposing changes to any bylaws. He's not proposing changes or any new bylaws or any, any such changes. He's just saying that we resolve that they should do this. As you all know, we can't order the selectmen to do anything. That's a separate body of government under, our, uh, under the Town Manager Act, and we just don't have that authority, but we can suggest to them that they would like it, and I believe that's the spirit of Mr. Leonard's um, substitute, Mr. Leonard? Yeah, okay. So do you all understand what we're going to vote on? We're going to vote on first Mr. Leonard's substitute motion. Wait, wait. Oh, no, I thought we just started. All right. We didn't terminate the debate yet, Don? All in favor terminate, terminating the debate, please say yes. Yes. Opposed? No. Debate is terminated. Okay, now we're going to vote on Mr. Leonard's substitute motion first. All in favor of Mr. Leonard's substitute, please say yes. Yes. Opposed? No. In my opinion, it is substituted. We now have the main motion before you, which is uh, Mr. Leonard's substitute motion. All in favor, please say yes. Yes. Opposed? No. It is an affirmative vote of the substitute motion, as I so declare it. Thank you, Mr. Leonard. Affirmative. That brings us to Article 16. Bylaw Amendment Streets. We have a recommended vote of no action. All in favor, recommend a vote of no action. Please say yes. yes. Opposed? My opinion is affirmative vote for no action. And I so declare it. That moves us on to Article 17. Overnight parking fees. Recommend a vote of no action. Is there a substitute? Do you have a substitute, sir? Come forward. Thank you, Mr. Moder Moderator. Jim Ballin, Precinct 6. Um, I'm submitting a substitute motion for the no action vote of the Board of Selectmen on Article 17, and this is in the form of a resolution. Thanks, Dan. Um, this was passed out on your uh, seat last Monday, um, but I will read it since it's short. It says, be it resolved that town meeting believes that the following fees are fair and reasonable for properties granted on-street overnight parking permits. $150 for an initial one-year permit and thereafter $25 for each subsequent, e subsequent year. Uh, let me provide a little bit of brief back background on this. Um, the Board of Selectmen has recognized uh, for at least the last 20 years or so um, that some vehicle owners should be granted an exemption to the overnight parking ban due to lack of um, available off-street parking on their property. Uh, the Board of Selectmen approves this on a case-by-case -case basis. Um, 
uh, approves these requests for exemptions um, for uh, allow residents to park on the street in front of their house. Um, there are currently approximately uh, 80 or so um, uh, vehicles uh, within Arlington that have these approved permits um, th for this year. And um, the current permit cost is uh, $200 per year. Um, now, the proponents of this, uh, of this resolution have done some um, significant research on other permit fees in neighboring um, Boston area cities and towns. Um, generally, the fees that we've discovered have been between $10 and $30 per year. Uh, we did not find any city or, town uh, city or town in the greater Boston area or even statewide that charged more than $30 a year uh, for such a permit. Uh, just a couple of quick examples of um, cities and towns. Medford, $10. Somerville, $30. Cambridge, $25. Uh, Malden, $5. Boston apparently is free. Um, Newton, $25. Brooklyn, $25. Everett, $10. Uh, again, Arlington is $200. Um, now, the, I just want to quickly mention um, a couple of reasons why I think um, most other cities and towns do not charge more than $30 a year. Um, there is a legal precedent for charging permit fees. Um, it is a Supreme Judicial Court opinion, um, Emerson College versus City of Boston, um, that held that permit fees may only be assessed in amounts necessary to recover actual costs. And uh, reading from the court, um, it stated, the charges are collected not to raise revenues, but to compensate the governmental entity providing the services for its expenses. Uh, fees in excess of the town's actual costs are, are revenue generating and uh, would be considered taxes which cannot be levied, levied through parking regulations. Um, I, I'm sure many of you are familiar with a couple of years ago, um, the school committee um, raised athletic fees and um, in many cases I believe those fees were considered um, in excess of what the actual costs were and um, that same issue came up with regard to those fees being excessive. Um, so I want to just talk quickly about what are the actual costs um, for issuing these permit fees. Um, at the request of the Board of Selectmen, um, the town manager issued a report on the town's cost um, to issue parking permits. Um, I believe Mr. Chapdelaine did a, um, an excellent job, uh, very thorough and careful analysis. A copy of his report was included in the packet that was provided to you. Um, in summary, the, um, the, his analysis showed that um, the actual cost for the town to um, to issue these permits is about $156 for the first year. Um, and that's essentially, as I mentioned in, in a minute, because there are additional costs um, the first time this permit is issued. Um, and thereafter, it's about $22 a year um, to issue the permit. Um, now, there was an additional $30, uh, $30 cost um, for uh, something that Mr. Chapdelaine uh, called an allocation of scarce resource. Um, it's not an actually an incurred cost by the town in issuing overnight parking permits, so, uh, in my opinion. Um, it would not be permitted by the Emerson College case. Um, this is just an excerpt from his uh, report. Um, basically, what it does is breaks down the um, cost for the initial permit, and as I mentioned, um, there is, uh, they, it is a case-by-case -case analysis, so um, there is some effort involved by the police, fire, board of selectmen, treasurer, um, to evaluate a property and determine whether it is qualified for the exemption, um, and that's why that cost came out to... Um, about $156 again, uh, again excluding these, this allocation of scarce resource fee. Um, and then for the reissuance every year after it's been approved once, there is, there is really no additional analysis that needs to be done. Uh, it's just the cost of basically printing and issuing the permit, which is about $22 a year. Um, so in conclusion, um, just want to provide a quick rationale for why uh, why we are looking for your support in this resolution. Um, I think the current $200 overnight parking fee uh, is excessive. It exceeds the town's actual costs um, in issuing the permit, and it's really not in line with any other city or town um, th that I've been able to find. Um, the regulation isn't, uh, I mean, I'm sorry, the resolution uh, is intended to encourage the selectmen to revise the overnight parking permit fee on public ways um, consistent with the town's actual costs. And I just want to point out, I do think that the, there are some litigation risks um, uh, for charging fees in excess of what the actual costs are. Um, let me just conclude um, by mentioning that um, the Board of Selectmen has agreed to put this matter um, of the overnight parking permit fee um, on the agenda for Board of Selectmen meeting um, this spring or summer, I've been told. 
Um, uh, but at this point, I urge you to show your enthusiastic, enthusiastic support for this resolution. Thank you. Do we have a second? Second, second okay. Uh, Mr. Dunn? Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Uh, Mr. Tabby, do you have a uh, comment that, that, uh, that we wrote at the time in response to the original language of the article? Um, I will say, so we did ask the town manager earlier this spring to look at the costs and he came back and he provided that report. As Mr. Balin suggested, I will be putting this on the agenda for a future Board of Selectmen meeting. Of course, we value the opinion of town meeting members and town meeting as a whole, but I will say that um, I guess I'm not sure that this is, I don't think we've got the right venue to discuss this because the, um, I think the, the Board of Selectmen meeting will be the right place to actually set what this number should be. Thank you. Hi, Stephen, Stephen Harrington, Precinct 13. I'm rising in support of this uh, resolution. And remember, this is a resolution. So we just want to tell the Board of Selectmen that we are supporting that they charge a just fee. Um, as Mr. Ballin pointed out, I just want to reiterate a couple points very quickly. One, we're only talking 80 families, 80 cars, and more like 60 families. Um, I had a good friend who uh, couldn't park on Newland Road because well, there was this big pile of ledge that his house was on top of. And so these are hardships. This isn't like that someone's trying to get a deal by parking in front of their house or uh, like an overnight parking ban exemption. These are people with hardships, and they do a lot of legwork to ensure that this is actually hardships. And so, um, you know, you don't need to add sort of insult to injury. It's already difficult enough to have to, you know, park in front of your house, move it when there's a, a snowstorm and things of that nature. So. You know, to charge a fee that's out of line, I think that's not a great idea. I think that, um, uh, as you mentioned, there is some litigation risk. There's been people who have been paying this fee for 10 years, and, you know, there's a strong argument that they've overpaid by a couple thousand dollars. And so um, we have an obligation um, as a town meeting to make sure that the town doesn't take on any type of risk like that. Um, and in addition, I think it's important that, um, that Public entities do follow uh, the Emerson principle, and that is that you know you don't charge a fee um, to raise revenue; that you charge a fee to cover the costs of the thing. Because at the end of the day, we're providing you know as a town, we're providing services to residents, and residents shouldn't pay a fee for that. So, um, thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Fisher. Uh, Andrew Fisher, Precinct 6. Um, I also urge a, a yes vote to support this. Even though I voted strongly in favor of retaining the overnight ban that's townwide, most of these people do have a, a hardship, and I don't, think it, uh, I don't think it contradicts retaining the townwide ban at all. Um, I believe that if the... Uh, Selectmen adopt some more clear criteria for who can attain this hardship. Theoretically, very few people additionally um, would be able to apply because they'd see what the criteria is for. Um, and also, I think it's simply a matter of the state law that it's not supposed to be a making money making proposition. Uh, the fee was only raised from 100 to 200 just. Uh, two or three or four years ago, I'm not sure which, for many of these places that it was just an understanding that the car could be on the street. And then at one point, I'm not sure how many, eight or 10 years ago, um, it was set at 100. Uh, so that's, that's my feeling, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Fisher. Mr. Langone. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. I'm Mitchell Lamb. Um, so when I parking ban, well, in the town you hear there's, there's 34,000 cars uh, that pay excess taxes in this town. There's 70 to 80 cars that have overnight parking stickers, which is a very low number. And basically, to get a parking sticker, an overnight parking sticker, you've got to have no driveway, 
it's got to be a hardship case. And you don't just give it to you. And the way that I received it was they had a parking subcommittee, which is made up of a few of the selectmen and town meeting manager and you know five, five other people all together, five people. And what they did was they checked out our area and then we had to go in front of them and they issued us our parking um, stickers. But they had to give it to you. They, they micromanaged us to the point where one of us needed, we had a two family and they had three cars. Well, you can only have one car on the street in front of your house. Well, our house is only 50 feet wide. So two cars would, it's a two family and it's 50 feet wide. So each side of the house is 25 foot. So you could put one car, we had three cars. So as a result, they gave them one sticker. So the other car is now parked on the patio in front of the house because they couldn't get a second sticker. And what should happen really is town meeting members should be a part of the parking subcommittee. The parking subcommittee are the people that also rule on who gets the permits. So uh, Mr. Greeley and Diane Mahorn, they're on the parking subcommittee then they are the ones that rule who gets the, the um, ticket, the sticker to park overnight. There's no imbalance, it's, it's bias. It's, you don't have anybody. So I think that a town meeting members should be involved when it's a um, hardship case and it's a problem with the citizens. The citizens have an issue, but the selectmen are on the board, they've already made their decision. So you're basically stuck with whatever they give you. So if you get two spots and you needed three, it's too bad. I know a lady on Lombard Terrace, she had two spots, no driveways. Two We're talking about this resolution and the amount of money, not the makeup of a selectman committee. There's nothing we can do about their committee. Right, but it, Bring it back to it our, ended up, what okay. it ended up, ended up being the $200 we had to pay for the tickets. And the people on Lombard Terrace, they paid $200 for their tickets, the two tickets. Their son got out of college and he couldn't get a place to park because they didn't have they would only let them have the two tickets in front of their house. Stickers, excuse me. So the $200 fee should be lowered after the first year. Just, just in the fact that it's, it's illegal what they're doing. The state doesn't allow them to make a profit on a fee. So that alone should lower it. And we also should have input. The town meeting should have input on the way that they're divvying out these tickets because, these stickers I mean, because they're not doing it fair and equitably. The people that are getting them are just, you know, fighting with them, and they're not even working with the public. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Lingon. Um, that woman in turquoise shirt, yeah. yeah. Hello, Marion King, Precinct 1. I rise in support of the substitution by Jim Balin. Um, I am a previous member of the, um, what, what did we call ourselves? Uh, no, it was the, the crime watch or neighborhood watch in Precinct 1. And there it was always said that whenever there are cars parked on the street, there is a much higher chance of crime in the area. However, I think there's another sort of crime that's been going on in East Arlington. As a former resident of Menominee Manor, the family low-income housing, who give one-third of their total income to Arlington Housing Authority, and I have tried to work this out with the Housing Authority in years gone by with no success. Only one parking space is allotted per household. No matter how many drivers in the family, no matter how many people are earning this income that they are taking one third of. And subsequently, the current policy in that area means that that area really is a hardship area as well because the lowest income people in town 
do not have adequate parking and are regularly ticketed and have such absurd amounts of expenses based on that that families frequently lose their cars and lose their ability to get to their employment. So I put forward that along with the houses that have no driveways, this is a significant contingent of Arlington that has been disrespected and not given any option for parking. I have spoke with selectmen many years back about this issue, and they just said go to the housing authority. So I just think that as a temporary measure, this resolution is the best thing that could be done for people in Menominee Manor, that perhaps they won't lose a significant amount of their income to being ticketed. Thank you. Thank you. Let's take our 10-minute break. The Arlington, Boy Arlington Boys Lacrosse team has cookies and other treats for us. Uh, we'll see you in 10 minutes.
Discussion of Article 9, Mr. Allen, you in the hall. You're going to get sworn in right away so you can participate. Wait, wait, stop right there. Where are you going? Just raise your right hand and swear it. Repeat after me. I, Harry Allen, pledge to attend all scheduled town meetings, to participate fully and fairly, evaluate all matters before town meeting, and to vote in the best interest of the town. I support free speech and will treat others with mutual respect in spite of conflicting opinions. and will conduct myself in a civil manner that is becoming of an elected town meeting member. And will conduct myself in a civil manner that is becoming of an elected town meeting member. Wait, one more part. This is never ending. I'm going to change it next year. Don't worry. I do solemnly swear that I will faithfully and impartially perform all the duties incumbent upon me. I will faithfully and impartially perform the duties incumbent upon me as a town meeting member in accordance with the bylaws, the Town Manager Act, and the general laws of the Commonwealth, so help me God. Thank you very much. All right. All right, that brings us back to Article 17. Mr. McCabe, you're next on the list. Not Harry, Mark. Mark McCabe. Uh, Mark McCabe, Precinct 2. I stand to terminate debate on Article 17 and all matters before it. All right, we have a motion to terminate debate on Article 17 and all matters before it. All in favor, please say yes. yes. Opposed? In my opinion, debate is terminated. We have before us a substitute motion of Mr. Balin which is, again, a resolution where we're directing the, the selectmen that we think certain things are wonderful. All in favor of Mr. Balin's resolution, substitute motion, please say yes. yes. Opposed? No. In my opinion, that is an affirmative vote. Okay, now we have the recommended vote as substituted by Mr. Balin. Substitute, all in favor, please say yes. Opposed? No. Again, I believe that's an affirmative vote. Um, and affirmative vote, and I so declare it. That brings us to Article 18, Daytime Parking. Recommended vote of no action. All in favor of no action, please say yes. Yes. Opposed? Affirmative vote for no action, and I so declare. It brings us to Article 19. Request to abolish the noise, reestablish the noise abatement committee. I recommend a vote of no action. I see no one making a substitute. All in favor of no action on Article 19, please say yes. yes. Opposed, say no. My opinion is affirmative vote of no action. I so declare it. Article 20. Transfer. Gee whiz, i got to put these up. To Conservation Commission town-owned parcels. We have a recommended vote of the Board of Selectmen of no action. All in favor, please say yes. Yes. Opposed, say no. Yes, ma'am. Do you have a substitute motion? Well, if there's no action on the thing, we don't take any, we don't have any debate or, unless some sub puts in a substitute motion, there's nothing to debate. <laughs> For the question. I can't hear you, madam. On which? Well, we're, we, we've just went through four articles in a matter of seconds. I don't know which one you're referring to. Article 20, we haven't taken the vote of no action yet. We're about to. Did that answer your question? We have a recommended vote of no action on Article 20. All right, what's your, what's your point of information? You have to come forward. He, we, stenographer and TV can't get it. <laughs> Would
What's your point of information, Ms. Fiore? Uh, Elsa Fiore, Precinct 2. Uh, and I was on the Conservation Commission for nine years. I was chairman for three many years ago. And of course, we always tried to get all the land that we could. And uh, I was just wondering what pieces of town owned land there are around Spy Pond, and I thought that the town owned Spy Pond. Uh, I do know that uh, a few years ago, about 15 people didn't want to pay taxes on well, their Ms. little piece of land. Wait, and yeah, that, yeah, that's another article. Yeah, in that's, the a whole different, that's a whole different yeah. ball of wax. There's no article, no pieces of property are being transferred or moved around here. They put it on and then they decided they didn't want to do anything with it. So we're just treating this as a nullity. So there's not going to be any action? Taken no action. Then? We're not right. doing anything under this right, article. I'm sorry, I didn't have a chance to fully I'll look at it before okay. I not a problem. sat down. Okay. All in favor of no action on Article 20, please say yes. Yes. Opposed, say no. It's affirmative vote of no action. I so declare it. That moves us on to Article 21, Home Rule Legislation. Um, Evan Maurice. Mr. Dunn. Thank you, Mr. Barber. Town meeting members, you have our recommended vote and our full comment. I just wanted to reiterate a couple points. One is that this is not a guarantee of a job. It is just uh, permits access to be on the list such that he could be interviewed um, should he be high enough on the list. Uh, and I would also say, note that this vote has an expiration date. This is not a forever thing. This is only for the existence of this particular list. Lists exist for two years and we're partway through the list. I'd like to give the remainder of my time uh, to Mr. Maurice, who is a resident of Arlington. Okay, Mr. Maurice can speak as he is a resident. Oh, I forgot to press the button. Darn it. Uh, my Maurice. name is Evans Maurice, and I live at 218 Broadway in Arlington. Evan. Uh, the reason I'm here today is um, I'm a police officer for Harvard University, and um, a little while back I wanted to work for the town of Arlington. But uh, to my dismay, come to find out that I guess there's an age requirement that I guess I exceed the age requirement. So when I took the exam, my scores were not being shown on the Arlington list. And all I'm asking is for the town to consider to have my scores be seen on the list. And if at any time, if Arlington was hiring, maybe I can get a shot to get an interview or to probably, you know, jump onto the Arlington PD. Um, if I was in a civil service department, which Harvard is not, I don't think the age requirement would matter because I could lateral from whatever department to Arlington without having to worry about the age requirement. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Mr. Hanner, did you wish to speak? Bill Hainer, Precinct 2. I rise in support of the motion, but I would like to remind this body and the selectmen that for several years we had quite a few of these come forward. And uh, I thought, I don't think anything ever passed, but the idea was that the town look at this particular thing as far as the age requirement and either do away with it or make something so that it does not have to come to this body each town. I do not question uh, the, the veracity or the qualifications of the people that have ever been brought forward, but this body spends an, had spent quite a bit of time doing this several years. It's the first time it's come up. Uh, again, I still, I will support the motion, but I think that the selectmen or whomever has this bylaw, take a look at this more carefully. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hainer. Mr. Wagner. Thank you, Carl Wagner, Precinct 11. Uh, reiterating and adding to what was just said, I don't feel that I could judge that gentleman, nor should I be able to judge that gentleman, and I don't think those of us sitting here should. Therefore, I think we should go by the existing rules that are in place and not allow this to happen. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Wagner. Mr. Moore. Christopher Moore, Precinct 12. I move to terminate debate on this article. Second. Motion to terminate debate under the article. All in favor, please say yes. Yes. Opposed? No. My opinion, that is a two-third vote. Okay, we have the recommended vote of the Board of Selectmen. As printed in your report, all in favor, please say yes. Yes. Opposed? No. In my opinion, it is an affirmative vote. And that, that, that 
terminates Article 21. Article 22. Home Rule Legislation, Municipal Finance Department. We have two recommended votes. Recommended vote of the Board of Selectmen, four to one for no action. Recommended vote of 13 to five of the Finance Committee for no action. All in favor of no action on Article 22, please say yes. Yes. Opposed? In my opinion, that is an affirmative vote for no action, and I think that puts that to bed. 23. Home Rule Legislation Public Art Fund. We have a recommended vote of the Board of Selectmen as printed in their report. Mr. Dunn. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. I just wanted to be clear that this article uh, is not a funding article and that there is no appropriation that is contemplated for this article. It is a vehicle for future donations, so that uh, for, for pieces of art that the town owns, uh, if we, we need the, the intent is to create a vehicle where donations can be made that then can be expended from for the maintenance of those uh, for public art. Thank you. I mean, oh, wait a second. We have uh, Ms. Rice has pointed out to me one more typographical error in the third line down, last or in that sentence should be of. Yes, yeah, so it should read the very third line down, may receive gifts of grants of money. So we're going to make that administratively. Yep. The sixth line down, Grant, gifts or grants of money. Removal of public works of art. So it's a, I'm mistaken. Last line that removal of public works of art. So ignore what I said first, change that last or to an of. We'll make that change administratively. Uh, Mr. Harrington, did you wish to speak? Um, I rise in, um, against this article. Um, it's not because I'm against spending money. Um, there is no money here. Um, I love public art. Um, I just don't like public funding spent on public art. You can imagine maybe that in the future, um, you know, that uh, we'll make appropriations to this fund. There's no reason that a 501c3 um, can't take donations. Um, there's no reason you can't do fundraising. You can do everything outside of having a public fund um, that this article purports to want to do. So the only reason to set up a public fund is to be able to make appropriations to it. And so, you know, let's not kid ourselves, that's the point of this article. And like I said, I love public art, but I don't think that maybe, you know, in the future you might have, um, um, say, a, a statue uh, to commemorate the um, biggest public works project in Arlington, and it might be this colossus across Mass Ave greeting visitors as they come in. And while that might be something that some might want, I don't want to spend the public's funds on that type of public art. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Mr. Chaffert. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Roland Chapter Precinct 12. Ladies and gentlemen, we're kind of in a dilemma here. I'm sure you're all aware there's a Cyrus C. Dallin Art Museum. It's been here for quite a while now. You can always give money to it, or you can give art. Whether it be private art or public art, you can certainly give art to it. That's one source. Last year, town meeting set up a new Arlington Cultural Commission. And the game plan for that group is to promote art in our town. Now, interestingly enough, the way that legislation happened to have been set up, there's no money. Um, I was appointed the treasurer of that group, and I've subsequently set up an account through the controller's office so that when the time comes and po folks would like to give the Cultural Commission some funding for whatever purpose related to some improvement or enhancement to the arts, we can, we can make it happen, okay? Now, what does this do? This really just says, yes, we really want to do something in the terms of appreciation for the arts. It doesn't say how and it doesn't say how much, 
but it gives us an opportunity to do it. And to me, that makes a lot of sense. So whether you want to give to the Cyrus Dallin Art Museum or you want to give to the Cultural Commission or you just want to send the money off to the town somehow so it gets addressed to the arts, I think it's worth doing. Mr. McKinney. Uh, Lawrence McKinney, um, Precinct 7. I rise, like Mr. Shaput, in, in support of this measure. Uh, I agree that anything for the arts is good. I may be a, a bit monomaniacal about a certain statue, but I would think <laughs> that this statue would also be included. It, could, it needs to be looked after. We have some public art, the other major, um, the, the, the Indian and other things like that. New art, I'm all in favor of. Supporting art, I am in favor of. But for my own committee, I've always wondered how we were ever going to take care of that poor statue. And perhaps this would be one of those opportunities for there at least there to be a place for funding to be allocated so that places like, well, statues and uh, museums and such could be more adequately funded. And for whatever help that would give to our community, I would support this, uh, this article. Thank you. Mr. Jamison? Pass. Pass. Mr. Ruderman? Pass. Pass. Uh, Mr. Swilling? Nathan Swilling, Precinct 4, move to terminate debate on all matters. Mr. Swilling has moved to terminate debate on all matters before the article. All in favor of terminating debate, please say yes. yes. Opposed? No. In my opinion, that's not a two-third vote. Uh, Ms. Howard? Jane Howard, Precinct 10, and member of the Public Art Committee. Uh, just for your information, uh, 20 years ago, uh, we as a town meeting voted that the Cultural Commission uh, would be accepted by town meeting. And the town was, has had the authority to name a Cultural Commission since that time. It was never operated on by the town manager, and this year, both the town manager and the school committee have made their nominees, and now there are seven people who, who are on the Cultural Commission. This article was introduced by the Public Art Committee, which is part of Vision 2020's uh, Culture and Recreation Task Group. And as you probably know, the Public Art Group has sponsored several installations or programs this year. This deals with art in the broad, and it's only asking permission to have uh, the ability to have such a fund. That fund would be administered through the town manager who would report to the selectmen. Uh, I feel very strongly that we have no entity in town for this purpose. It is to serve broad, uh, art in the broad, not just um, visual art, but music, film, all kinds of other community events. And since we don't have such a thing, I think it would be wonderful just to have the ability to have it. As you know, uh, Mr. Chapet also brought up the fact that uh, another fund exists in town for donations. And you're all aware that there is another article, Article 40, 40 in uh, the Finance Committee that asks for an appropriation for the from the town for that uh, article which is for the water bodies, which the town really has no, no place to fund now. The beauty of this fund, like that one, would be that there is a fund that doesn't have to turn over its donations at the end of the year and could be accumulated as uh, they are needed. These funds come in, their donations. Uh, that mural on the back of the Boys and Girls Club, which serves as the canvas for the public entity of Spy Pond was all done through private donations. But it's a little difficult to raise those kinds of money. So I heartily ask your uh, indulgence to just let this at least go to the 
uh, state house for approval so that we can then bring it back to town and try to establish it. Thank you. Howard. Mr. McCory. Pass. Mr. Hainer. Bill Hainer, Precinct 2, twice in one night. It's scary. Um, just for clarification, uh, when Mr. Dunn got up, he implied that there's no money in, involved in this article, yet, and I, I accept that, but yet in this article it, it, it states, uh, notwithstanding any general or special law to the contrary, the town of Arlington may establish a special account in which may be appropriated sums of money to be raised by the general tax or otherwise, and it goes on. Does this, what I'm asking is, does this allow a future date to come forward for, uh, for the town to appropriate specific money for this fund? Mr. Dunn, would you like to answer that? The answer is yes. Legally, there could be. What I, try, what I said, and I apologize if I wasn't clearing, is that there isn't funding and there is no appropriation contemplated, which is, di which is different. If legally, there could be, but I, in my comment, I was trying to state that we have no intention of that. At this time? Correct. So but, it's, it's some future time, some future committee, uh, selectmen could come forward. And then town if meeting, this language is passed. And then town meeting would get to vote that, yes. Thank you. Mr. Deist. John Deist, Precinct 13. I have a question. Um, as many of you know, this town hall is almost a piece of art, and it contains many important pieces of art owned by the town. Could, can those things uh, for example, the paintings upstairs in the hearing room uh, be maintained by this fund? Uh, Mr. Dunn or Mr. Chapdelaine, whoever wishes to answer. Uh, the answer is legally yes. That could, that, I don't think, that is not the specific intent of this article, but it definitely would be permitted. So, uh, for example, um, out in, right in front of this town hall are some, some lovely pieces uh, by Cyrus Dallin, uh, the flagpole, the base of the flagpole, all those things are historically important to the town and owned by the town. The town owns pieces of art and this fund would serve to maintain and maybe add to those beautiful pieces of art. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Deist. The woman right behind Mr. Deist. Oh, her. Catherine Gandek Tai, Precinct 18. Uh, there are, in my experience, from having set up 501c3, which Mr. Harrington referred to, and having dealt with municipal endowed funds, purposes for all of these things. Um, when you set up a 501c3, you're taking on a burden with filing, you're taking on a lot of legwork, you're taking on a board, you're taking on a whole infrastructure which is organized and set up by, from the federal level on down to make sure that that money is used in a certain process and it comes with people who are willing to devote themselves to that process. And there are a lot of people who volunteer in Arlington. When you're dealing with money that is donated to a fund that is administered by the town, if money were to go to this fund, um, it comes with a certain amount of infrastructure. It also comes with a certain amount of anonymity frequently. For instance, many of the things that we benefit from at the Robbins Library are not paid for by town funds. They are paid for by private donations and they're paid for by endowed funds that people have given over the years specifically to the town to support the Robins, to support the things they can do. Now, on the one hand, this could be looked at as a fund that is a place that eventually our taxes are going to pay for and that's where the money goes. And that's a perfectly, perfectly viable potential interpretation. It also could be a fund 
where people who have an affection for something about the town or the artwork in the town, in addition to possibly supporting the Cyrus Dallin Museum, which is focused on Cyrus Dallin, could support artwork in the town. You could start a 501c3, somebody would have to be driven, they'd have to recruit the board, there'd be fundraising, all of that might happen. However, this also gives the vehicle for someone who, when they, frequently it's when they die, um, want to make a bequest, don't care about the tax implications of donating to a 501c3 versus just giving the money, then this gives them a vehicle to make a financial donation or to, to receive art in my totally, totally un legally professional opinion, and I'm sure Julianne will tell me if I'm wrong. Did the woman right next to you have a did you have your hand raised? No, okay. Um, Sean Harrington. Sean Harrington, Precinct 15, I move the question. We have a motion to terminate debate. All in favor, please say yes. Yes. Opposed? In my opinion, that debate is terminated. We have before us to recommend a vote of the Board of Selectmen. All in favor, please say yes. Yes. Opposed? No. In my opinion, that is an affirmative vote. Affirmative. And that terminates Article 23. Article 24, our composition of retirement board members. We have a recommended vote of the Board of Selectmen. Mr. Dunn. Uh, members of town meeting, you have the recommended vote of the Board of Selectmen. I just want to make clear something that wasn't in the comment, which is that this change in their uh, stipend does not make them eligible for any retirement benefits and it does not affect uh, any health insurance status. Uh, that said, I'd like to invite uh, Mr. John Billifer to uh, speak for the remainder of my time. Thank you very much, Mr. Moderator, and thank you, town meeting members, for allowing me to speak on this article. I'm John Billifer, the chairman of the Arlington Contributory Retirement Board. For those of you who may be unfamiliar with the Retirement Board, it is a five-person board with two private sector members, one appointed by the Board of Selectmen, and the second member is elected by the other four Retirement Board members. There are two public sector members elected by the town employees and retirees. The fifth member is the town comptroller who serves ex officio. The retirement board is responsible for overseeing the administration of all matters concerning retirement, including the approval of all accidental, ordinary, and regular retirement applications for all town employees except school teachers. The board is also responsible to administer and oversee the investment of the $117 million retirement portfolio as part of the state mandated full funding of Arlington's pension liabilities and accomplishing that full funding requirement in a financially responsible manner, working with the finance committee to stay within the boundaries of Arlington's long-range financial goals. The Arlington Retirement Board is the only local retirement board in the state that I know of to also be responsible for the investment, <clears throat> excuse me, and administration of the $4.2 million OPEB, or Health Insurance Trust Fund. Recently, Governor Deval Patrick and the state legislature passed the Pension Reform Act revising the pension eligibility for future public sector retirees. As part of that act, the stipend of local retirement board members could be increased to $4,500 per year, provided, however, the local retirement board members meet the following requirements. First, that each retirement board member is required to annually file a statement of financial interest, which mandates full disclosure of the following information to PERAC, the Public Employee Retirement Administration Commission, 
the state agency that oversees the operation of all local retirement boards. Each local retirement board member, on behalf of their spouse and dependent children, must first disclose all equity owned in any business. Second, disclose any gifts or honorarium received in excess of $1,000. Third, full disclosure of all stocks, bonds, or other investment securities owned by the family. Four, identify all mortgages outstanding in excess of $1,000. Five, identify all other loans outstanding in excess of $1,000. And six, the names of any creditors that might have forgiven a debt in excess of $1,000. In addition to the filing of this annual statement of financial interest, each retirement board member is required to complete 18 hours of PERAC approved coursework over a three year period. Failure to perform the 18 hours of coursework or failure to complete and file the annual statement of financial interest will result in an automatic order of dismissal of the delinquent retirement board member by PERAC, the state agency. Now, it's not the purpose of the retirement board to get up there, up here and file this article uh, in opposition to other boards and committees. We're well aware uh, that other boards and committees might be paid less than, uh, than this stipend that we're requesting. Uh, most of that, or all of that, is done, or I might add, say, most of the boards and committees operate under state statute, and it's the state agencies or the state uh, committees uh, that are formed uh, for these uh, various boards and committees on the state level that would have the responsibility to, uh, to uh, uh, look at the compensation of these various boards and committees and uh, agree or disagree that they deserve added compensation. We're not here in competition. We realize uh, that other boards and committees work very hard in the town. Some of them are not paid at all. Uh, in this instance, uh, Deval Patrick and the state legislature, in their wisdom uh, in requiring these rather strict financial regulations, felt that uh, in order to maintain private sector attendance on these boards, uh, that they would uh, sweeten the pot, if you will, uh, by increasing the compensation. Uh, I would ask you to uh, support this article and uh, uh, myself, or Rich Greco, our retirement administrator, are here to answer any questions you might have regarding this article or the retirement board in general. Thank you very much for listening to me. Thank you, Mr. Um, Billifer. The woman over here on the right side, right behind Ms. Bolts, that's you, yep. Hi, good evening, Linda Hansen, Precinct 7. I, I think Mr. Belaffer made a great um, case for the hard work that goes into that board and, and why the level of compensation is fair, and I'm going to support this motion. But when I was reading over this article, it did make me think about what you brought up at the end about all the different boards and committees that there are and the varying levels of, of compensa compensation for those. So I was just thinking at some point it might be nice for town meeting to get a review of the various boards and committees and the different le differing levels of compensation just to kind of take and have a look at it at some point. But I, I will support this article. Mr. Tosti, can you do that for us next year? <laughs> Thank you. Um, Mr. Loretti. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Chris Loretti, Precinct 7. I rise in opposition to this article, and I'd like to explain why. Uh, Mr. Billifer mentioned PIRAC, PIRAC which tracks the uh, local options that uh, member communities have adopted. There are 100 odd, or roughly 100 um, retirement boards within the state of Massachusetts overseen by PIRAC. And prior to 1995, retirement board members did not get paid anything. It was uh, in 1995 that special legislation was passed to allow that. 
To this day, 40, roughly 40% 40 of the boards still receive no payment whatsoever. It was in 2011 that um, the law that Mr. Billifer referred to was changed, and that allowed um, payment of up to $4,500. And at this time, there's only been 12 communities that have adopted it. Now, there might be a few others that haven't yet informed PIREC, but definitely a very small minority. And, uh, and, and that's part of the reason I don't see that it's necessary. And I also want to clarify that, you know, even if the town does not approve this um, increase, all of the retirement board members are still required to file all of those disclosures. This, you know, if we do not pass this, they still have to do that. And that's what any fiduciary would do or would have to do. There's nothing unusual about that. And the state recognized the need to professionalize these boards and, and require the same types of disclosures that other fiduciaries are required to provide. And that's why that, the law was amended by, uh, at the time. Uh, Mr. Billifer mentioned the composition of the board. I just want to clarify one point. When he used the term ex officio, he is using that term correctly. We've heard that term used a couple times at town meeting to refer to extra members of boards who are on the boards without um, the legislation creating that board or committee uh, reflecting that. So people talked about you know, an extra selectman on the leaf blower committee or a non-voting member on the uh, electronic study committee. Uh, I think those um, members are better referred to as extraneous or illegitimate members. They're not ex officio <laughs> members. Ex officio means you are there by virtue of holding another office. And the comptroller is the ex officio member of the retirement board because she holds that position. When she stops being the, the comptroller, she's not going to be on the board anymore. The new comptroller is. That's what ex officio means, period. Um, but I also want to point out that the board has a board administrator, and the board administrator does all the heavy lifting for this board. Mr. Greco keeps very good minutes uh, of the meetings, he does the agendas, and he does all the other administrative work as well. So I took a look at the minutes for the, for the uh, first three months of this year, and I thought I would um, just share a little bit of information with you. The, the board typically meets Thursday afternoons, and um, on in the March meeting, they met for an hour. February, they met for 45 minutes. January, they met for about 80 minutes. Uh, so they averaged about 60 minutes. And then in, in January, uh, I noticed they also approved a trip to Hawaii for one of their members to, um, to attend a conference related to retirements. And I would ask any of you who work in the real world, how many of you get an extra $4,500 a year for attending a once a month meeting that aver average about, averages about an hour in length and is normally held during your regular business hours. If you're retired and no longer working, how many of you do volunteer work for an hour a month and receive $4,500 a year in compensation? Uh, Mr. Billifer already mentioned some of the other committees. I think it's important to realize or recognize that the school committee gets paid absolutely nothing. The, re the redevelopment board gets paid absolutely nothing. And I suggest that they put in at least as much time and serve this town uh, with at least as much diligent and effort, if not more, than the retirement board members. So in closing, it seems to me that $3,000 per year is entirely adequate. $4,500 per year would make the retirement board the second most highly compensated board within in the town, just slightly less than the board of assessors. And the Board of Assessors themselves, if you looked at uh, peer communities, is much higher than any of their peers. So this isn't to say in any way that I um, uh, am ungrateful for the uh, work that the Retirement Board does, but I think we need to be realistic. We need to uh, be consistent with the other boards in the town, and we need to be consistent with other communities. I don't think we need to be in the top 10 or 15 percent of communities when it comes to uh, compensating board members. Thank you, and please join me in voting against this article. Thank you, sir. Uh, Mr. Jamison. Uh, thank, <laughs> excuse me. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Gordon Jamison, Precinct 12. Um, I have a couple questions, and then I'll uh, make a few statements. Um, Mr. Billiford made a nice introductory statement. It was not clear to me whether um, these filings are uh, also based upon Ms. Loretti's comments. Are these filings uh, 
fiduciary filings by the members required now or only because of this new legislation? Mr. Billifer? Yes, and they are required as part of this, this legislation, and they're required to be filed annually, uh, and if they're not filed, uh, the delinquent member is uh, taken off the board. So current, just don't go, don't go away. Um, currently, you don't have to file these papers. Well, currently, we do. Oh, so already you do. Oh, yes. We've so this already, is not an additional requirement. We've, uh, we've already filed one set last year, uh, and the board members are in, in uh, uh, the process of complying this year. I'm, I'm still confused. Um, before, this, before this legislation was passed to the State House, like when I came to your meetings a couple years ago, right. did you have to file this type no. of paperwork then? No, okay. the legislation so, required. Like, so this is additional paperwork. Right. Um, and uh, it, you mentioned also that there are 18 hours of, of uh, training that you have to go to over three years? Yes, the coursework is prescribed by PEREC. And that was not a previous requirement to, no, like when I came before? It wasn't. And there, is there a cost to the member to attend or is that borne by the board? Uh, no, the members pay for their own cost to get to the meetings. Okay. Uh, that's, that, and then I had a couple more questions. You have five members. Ms. Uh, Lewis is ex officio. Yes, she is. Does she get the stipend or not? Yes, she would. Okay. Um, during town meeting, you're asking us just to make sure uh, about to appropriate about $10 million, uh, most of it into the pension fund, but some of it into the OPEB. Is that about right? Uh, the OPEB is a separate article. But the total is about $10 million, give or uh, take. Yeah, I think so, yes. Okay. And um, you manage about, well, hopefully about $125 million. Um, I noticed I went saw one of your most recent reports from your consultant that does your, your numbers and tells you how much should be paid in every, every year by the town. And this is a, an increasing, uh, and uh, pardon my language, ballooning cost that should be of our, one of our highest concerns going forward to figure out how to get a fully funded pension plan without breaking the bank. And then we have to go fund the retirement part of the, the health care part of that afterwards, which is what the OPEB is, other post-employment benefit, translation, uh, retirement, health care. I might correct you, Gordon, on that. The OPEB uh, is not required funding uh, at this Yet. point. Arlington has started it, yes. so we'd be ahead of the curve because I fully expect that the state will require the funding of that. So. Uh, before, within the next 10 before years. I make my final comments, um, my question is, um, when I looked at that uh, timeline of funding based upon the consultant's most recent uh, available online analysis, it didn't look like the doubling of the Dow in the last three years was going to help us. Um, can you comment on that quickly? The Dow, the Dow has doubled since 2009 or... Um, well, I want to know how these guys are doing on performance, Mr. Harrington. Yeah. I'm giving them a raise. Performance and... Uh, well, now, do we well, repeat uh, the question? As, as this town meeting recognizes, uh, the, uh, the retirement board acceded to the town meeting and the finance committee's wishes a number of years ago and put the state, the investment of the state of the town's retirement portfolio in with the state retirement portfolio, which a number of retirement boards have done since then. Uh, so we're, we're oversee, of course, the investment of those funds. Uh, and I understand that, uh, uh, that the state retirement system uh, achieved ab about a 12% return last year. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Billifer. A um, Couple comments and then I'll uh, close. Um, so if, if you came before me asking for a raise, if I was going to my boss and asking for a raise, I would, I would ask about the comparable salaries, which Mr. Loretti mentioned. And there are many people um, who provide reports. All of these don't get paid. Well, the Finance Committee gets a little bit, but uh, their total compensation for 21 members is uh, a little over $3,000. The selectmen get paid 3000 except for the, the person who's in the chair and the catbird seat, and that's Mr. Dunn. He gets $3,500. Um, that's a revolving position, not a... So, um, 
and and those those are those are the basically the highest ones as mr already mentioned the board of assessors get 4900 um, mr billifer was helpful in my analysis of this my initial um, thought was to speak against this um, i'll speak for this particularly because the members now have to do this filing which they did not use ha used to have to do and uh, trusting mr billifer's comments that they will have to bear the cost of these six hours per year for the next three years of training so I think we should enable them to be able to have that um, while maintaining the current level of compensation. What I would ask is for the board to consider meeting at a time other than Thursday afternoons, which is inconvenient for most of us. Um, when I attended a couple years ago, I had to take time off work to attend. Um, and that they also consider giving us a written report every year in that we spend, like I mentioned, $10 million this year. I'd like to have a, a report uh, with one five-year, 10-year, and 10-year year-to-date performance and other in information they might like to provide to us. So with that, I close and look forward to those things next year and uh, move positive action. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Mr. Tosti. The Finance Committee sort of wrestled with this issue quite a while. And it does become difficult when you're trying to compare them to the, uh, the Board of Selectmen or the, uh, or the Board of Assessors or, or a few of the other boards that, um, that get a small stipend, and that's what this is. And I think uh, we came down in favor of this for three primary reasons. The new disclosure regulations are uh, uh, a much, much, much greater burden than any of the other boards uh, have to take have to do. Um, in fact, when these regulations first came out, there was a wave of resignations from retirement boards uh, across the state. I don't have an exact number, but there was quite a few because uh, they simply did not want to deal with this. So I think those regulations are, and the, and the disclosure regulations are, are quite onerous in many ways. Secondly, uh, they have a substantial continuing education requirements. Uh, more so than uh, any other of the boards. I think the assessors have to do some, but not to this degree. And I, thir I think third is they have a much greater direct responsibility for the investment of funds. Uh, uh, fiduciary responsibility. It used to be for all of the pension funds, which are now done through PRIT, but now you know, almost $5 million of OPEB funds, which none of the other boards directly do uh, on that. And I think because of these three reasons, the Finance Committee came uh, across to, uh, to support this uh, uh, increase, and we hope you do too. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Tosti. Mr. McCabe? Uh, Mark McCabe, Precinct 2. I stand to terminate debate on Article 24 and all matters before it. Second. We have a motion to terminate debate on Article 24. It's been seconded. And all in favor, please say yes. Yes. Opposed? No. In my opinion, the debate is terminated. We have before us a recommended vote of the Board of Selectmen as printed in their report. All in favor, please say yes. Yes. Opposed? No. My opinion, that is a negative vote. Okay, we have five people rising. Same tell is all in favor of the recommended vote. Please rise. Ms. Mahan, how many up front? Twelve. Twelve up front. Mr. Schlickman, how many to my left? Nine. Nine. Mr. O'Connor? Twenty. Twenty-two left center. Mr. Arrington? Twenty-one. Twenty-one right center. Mr. McCabe? Twenty-four. Twenty-four. All opposed, please rise. Ms. Mahan, up, how many up front? 
zero up front. Mr. Schlickman. 23 to my left. Mr. O'Connor. 25. 25. Mr. Harrington. 24. 24. Mr. McCabe. 9. Nine. The vote is in the affirmative, 88 to 81. It's affirmative vote, and I so declare it. Standing vote, 88 to 81. That brings us to Article 25. Certain Wednesday at 8 p.m., the Director of Assessments and uh, the Chairman of the Board of Assessors are not available this evening. Okay, we have a motion to postpone to a time certain. First thing Wednesday. All in favor of postponing to Wednesday evening, please say yes. Yes. Opposed? No. In my opinion, that's an affirmative vote. It is postponed to Wednesday. Um, uh, when we do get to this, our assistant moderator is going to take the chair on 25. Uh, after going through an extensive online ethics test, I've determined that I have a personal interest in it and that I own a business in town and I'm affected by this article, so I'm going to step down. We're going to let Jim take over for the article. So be, be, be kind to him. That brings us to Article 26. We have the recommended vote of the Board of Selectmen for no action. All in favor, please say yes. yes. Opposed? So remember to vote for no action, and I so declare it. That brings us to Article 27. We have recommended a vote of the Board of Selectmen on the CBGB application. Oh, did we get reports? Oh, man, I didn't get one. On the first night uh, on the seats, April, uh, the 22nd. You got an extra for me? Um, can I hand it to you after I'm done? Yeah. <laughs> All right, I will do that. You guys? Thank you, Mr. Moderator. So before you, you have, uh, so uh, th it looks like this. It was on the seats the first night of town meeting. Uh, I do not know if any are in the back at this point. Um, uh, so the, as you all know, or probably know, community development block grants are br sent to the town uh, from the federal government. And this is an unusual piece of money because it actually isn't appropriated by town meeting. It is distributed by a vote of the Board of Selectmen with a vote of the town manager. So uh, this actually is, we're seeking your approval and your input, though technically the, the actual authority is the Board of Selectmen in this case. I did want to make a couple comments about this. First of all, uh, CDBG funds are a declining amount of money. Uh, the federal government is giving us less every year for this program. So when we look at this, we don't even have the option of saying, let's level service fund it. We don't have the option of saying, let's just level fund it and cut services. We actually have to go into these budgets and figure out you know, what is on the chopping block. And what we do, and so one of the things that we tried to do this year in particular was, you know, you sit there in these meetings and the town manager, we sit there, we go through each one and we say, we want to fund each one of these. And the town manager says, well, maybe what I'll do is I'll get, you know, Christine Connolly to take over this particular part of it. Or maybe I'm going to get uh, someone in the planning department to take over this part of it. The nature of that, unfortunately, is when you cut things at the federal government, how they get picked up on the town level. And frankly, the town is already doing as much as it can with the resources it has and trying to add things onto the list is very painful. So what we've been working to do is to find private charities that we can hand off some of these programs to. So when we made our cuts, we specifically tried to find things that we could say, this is um, something that can be done by another body. Let's see if we can persuade this other private body to go out there and fundraise. And that way, rather than having the responsibility roll from the federal government down to the town government, we're trying to roll the responsibility from the federal government to a private entity to permit the town to continue to do the work that, are, uh, that, you know, that is ordinarily uh, the town's priorities. The other thing that I'll say is that when we made our, our choices on what to cut, uh, we 
were less likely to cut things that were related, that were related to the physical health of individuals, and we were more likely to cut things that were related to um, activities. Even if they're activities that we all want to support, in general, the things that we uh, chose to support were health over activities. So I think that uh, the members, uh, uh, we're happy to answer any questions you have about uh, the choices we made. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Baer. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Paul Bayer, Precinct 13. Just one question. On Boys and Girls Club scholarships, it says in the last line, funding is recommended at 13,500, a reduction from last year's funding of 13,500. That doesn't sound like a reduction. So which, which number is the right number? I need to go um, and answer the, another day to be absolutely certain, but I believe we level funded that. Okay, thank you. Anyone else have questions about CDBG funds? Oh, Mr. Loretti. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Chris Loretti, Precinct 7. I have a question about the uh, comprehensive master planning. It has a figure of uh, $50,000 in there. And I'm wondering, how much was that funded for last year? Um, Mr. Dunn, do you know that answer? The town manager report tells me it's the same number, 50,000. And Ms. Water, is it appropriate to ask, in addition to the CDBG funding, how much funding has there been last year and this year out of the regular town budget? In, in addition to, that's right, in, in, in addition to the CDBG funding. Mr. Chapdelaine, do you have that answer? Just bear with me. Adam Chapdelaine, town manager. There was funding included in last year's capital budget. It uh, wasn't actually in the operating budget for the comprehensive master plan. And I just want to quote you the accurate figure, Mr. Loretti. The capital plan in 2013 and 2014 includes a total of $150,000. So th that's for fiscal 2014, I'm sorry? 13 and 14. It was included in the 13 plan as well as in this uh, what yet to be heard 14 plan. So, and what was that total again? 150000 Okay, so a, a total of a quarter of a million, is that right, between the CDBG funding and the regular town appropriations? That's what's currently budgeted for, for, the, uh, for the plan, though, though we don't have an expectation uh, to necessarily spend up to that amount. Okay. I was just curious what happened um, with the funding last year, because it seems to me the, the um, consultant that was introduced last week came on fairly late. And if the money that was appropriated last year but was not spent, is that available or did that go away? Uh, so the different categories end up having different effective rules. Um, in that particular category, money can be accumulated over a, a num a, and unspent, and it still remains earmarked. Now, are you referring to the CDBG funds or both the CDBG funds and the regular appropriations? I'm referring to the CDBG funds. Okay. What about the regular appropriations of, from last year? Okay. To that question, but then we got to stay with the CBGBs, Mr. Loretti. Adam Chapdelaine, town manager. In general, capital funds are allowed to roll from year to year. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else wish to speak to this article? Seeing none, all in favor of the recommended vote of the Board of Selectmen, please say yes. 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 Opposed? Opposed? My opinion is an affirmative vote. That closes the Article 27, brings us to Article 28, revolving funds. Recommend a vote of the Board of Selectmen. We've got a pile of revolving funds. A couple pages of them. Go ahead. No comments? Anyone wish to, re 
discuss any of the revolving funds. Mr. Jamison. Thank you, Mr. Moderator Gordon Jamison, Precinct 12. Um, Longtime members will know this has become a pet project of mine. Um, if you look at all those numbers and look at the cash flows through them, it's over a million dollars that are in these funds that don't roll back into the general fund at the end of the year, they just perpetuate. And um, that's about three times as much that rolled through those funds versus fiscal year 07 based upon my quick research. I hearken back to the beginning of the meeting where both Mr. Dunn and Mr. Tosti said, things are good, but we need to be careful, if I recall correctly, or words to that effect, because there is a physical cliff for Arlington somewhere five or six years out. So this million bucks, you know, if we had this money, these revenues, and they went to the general fund, that's $5 million or so over five years, and something they use in the, the wording they use at the, uh, in, the, at, in DC is regular process, the regular budgetary process could be applied to them. Now, I don't know if that's necessarily the way we want to go, but increasingly as these funds increase, I'm tempted to file something that would suggest we obliterate them and go through regular process. What would keep me from moving that type of action in the future. Um, some more granularity about what these funds do. Um, in particular, the rescue fund, uh, through the good management of the town managers and negotiating uh, fees that they get through Armstrong's operations in town, have grown that quite to quite a large extent. Uh, I believe um, when we're paying for a new ambulance, part of those funds pay for that. That's a good thing. I'd like to see 10% of that $600,000 go to the rig, 40% go to staffing, 20% to pensions and insurance, 5% to building costs, the thing has to live somewhere, 5% to the dispatch, and then they get 20% for consumables and miscellaneous. If we had some granularity like that, then I would see how it was benefiting the town in general. So I'm going to vote for this this year, but next year I would hope to see a lot more granularity in the presentation, perhaps report similar to the CBDG with uh, the actual original charter of each of these looked at to make sure they're still on course, uh, any modifications that need to be made, and especially for these large ones, an idea of where the money actually goes. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Thank you, sir. Mr. Ruderman? Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Michael Ruderman, Precinct 9. Uh, l let us recall what, what is in the uh, spirit and, and the uh, practice of the revolving funds. These are the close and local maintenance of, of uh, many projects in town that are administered and are, are um, the fees roll back to, to the purpose to, to keep it going for another year. For example, in the Whittemore Robbins house, the, the costs of marketing, upkeep, repair, uh, the, the wear and tear, uh, the um, maintenance on a 200 plus year old structure is paid for out of, out of the weddings, the receptions, the meetings that are held there. Uh, it serves the purpose of, of entrepreneurship as well as custodianship and good stewardship of the asset to have the people who are responsible for, for promoting the use to be in charge of applying the funds to the upkeep of the property. So too for many of these revolving funds, the field user fees being, being a very visible example of that. You pay to use one of our town fields, you trust that the people who are collecting those fees are investing them back again in seed and sod and maintenance of, of the very asset that, that you are paying for. There's a principle here of good government and that we are trusting people who are the closest to the asset to do the job. If we require more, um, 
management speak granularity uh, in these. I believe it is you know, fully within our, our right and purview to ask for that. Let's give them enough notice and time to, to prepare, prepare those numbers for us and have them before us um, in time to review. Uh, I, I don't think there should be any, any uh, supposition that the money is being misspent until, until we've had the opportunity to invite those uh, comments and those uh, responses to our questions. So I ask you for a positive vote on this article. Thank you very much, Mr. Ruderman. Um, Mr. Berger. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Eric Berger, Precinct 6. Uh, I rise in support of this, but Mr. Jameson made the same point last year, and I, I seconded it, that we wanted some reports, uh, not that we suspect any misuse, but we want to be educated about, especially the funds that uh, the, the accounts that have uh, significant funding in them, uh, how the money is being spent, what's being achieved, and so on and so forth. And he made that request last year, and uh, I know that Mr. Chaplain was, uh, you know, has cooperated with us in many areas, so I want to second that this year, that next year we'd like to see some reports about what is being achieved and how the money is being spent, just so we become educated, so we can make uh, an intelligent vote about this, and, and also learn more we can explain it to some of the people that we represent if uh, the questions come up about revolving funds. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Madam. Why can't I? Uh, Debbie Edelstein, Precinct 9. I, my question is, are some of these funds, like some of our committees, obsolete? Um, some were established in the early 90s, have zero balance, have had zero expenditures. Are some of them just no longer, should we just close them? Thank you. I think that's a fair question. Uh, every time I've tried to find one that I could kill off, uh, someone gave me a reason why I couldn't kill it. But that doesn't mean that um, someone, we couldn't more aggressively prune things if we wanted to. I, th I think it is safe to say that most of these have some champion. And um, at, at times, it's easier to permit the champion to be excited about those things than it is to actually kill them off. Thank you very much. Anybody else wish to speak to revolving funds? Seeing none. All in favor to recommend a vote of the Board of Selectmen, please say yes. Yes. Opposed? It's a near unanimous vote, and I so declare. Affirmative. And that brings us to Article 29. Collective bargaining. We have sum of $89,000 to be set aside for future funding collective bargaining agreements. Does anybody? Up the front of the room, wish to speak about this? Just to emphasize, uh, there's one union that has not been, uh, they have, do not have a contract with. Uh, we have to set aside money. Uh, so this is the money that's set aside uh, for uh, future years, but also going back into past years. None of this money can be spent without a vote of this town, town meeting at some point in the future. Anyone wish to discuss $89,000 to be set aside for future funding of collective bargaining? Seeing none, all in favor, please say yes. yes. Opposed? It's a unanimous vote, and I so declare it. All right, unanimous. Okay. That brings us to Article 30, Position Reclassification. Mr. Chapdelaine, do you want to tackle this, or do you want us just to, like, wing it? Whoa. Adam Chapdelaine, Town Manager. <clears throat> this is the annual article uh, whereby we put before a town meeting uh, changes to the classification plan as well as additions or deletions to the classification plan. Uh, the classification plan is a comprehensive compensation uh, grid for all, uh, all both uh, union and non-union town employees.
Would anyone like to discuss uh, position reclassification? Mr. Sharp. Finance Committee, I believe. And then there is a report from, I believe, um, Human Resources telling us what's getting reclassified and to who and where. All right, no, anyone wish to discuss this? All in favor, fine, all in favor of recommend a vote, please say yes. yes. Opposed? A near unanimous vote, and I so declare it. Uh, Mr. Tosti. Hold. Mr. Moderator, uh, I wish to serve notice of reconsideration in Article 26. And uh, right now, as you see, that the budgets are the next item. Uh, therefore, uh, it would seem silly to start it at five minutes of 11. Uh, I move to adjourn. Okay, do we have any motions for reconsideration besides Mr. Tosti's? Seeing none, we have a motion to adjourn. All in favor, please say yes. Yes. Opposed? We'll see you on Wednesday night. We're going to start with number 25, put Jim on the hot seat for a few minutes, then go right into budgets. So spend the next night looking at budgets. Thank you very much.